Welcome back to our series on designing a mimic LNA. Um, in the last video, we started doing the layout. And uh, again, we're focusing on that all critical input matching network. Um, in this video, what we're going to do is we're going to start looking at some of the other components that we need to implement. And then we'll return back to our input matching network uh, to see how putting these components into the layout, these real components from the Triquin PED, um, impact our um, noise figure and gain and stability. Uh, what I have here is a, I put together a small schematic with a resistor from the TriQuint library. And this is the um, high frequency resistor. And um, let me just show you where that is. If we go to the elements palette and under resistors, you can see we have a number of choices. We have uh, high frequency and, and lumped. Um, I'm using the high frequency resistors and you'll notice that there's two different types which are essentially the same. Uh, the first is the um, high frequency model with configurable resistance. Um, and then the second one is what we call an intelligent high frequency model. Now this high frequency model has the ability to sense the width of the lines that it's attached to. And if you're operating at high enough frequencies, um, the equivalent of an M step or microstrip change in width um, is in the model that can allow the model to take into account those those differences in the width of the line and the width of the um, resistor itself. Now, a couple other interesting features about the resistor is it works for all the different resistor types, uh, the N minus, the nichrome, and the high value resistor simply by clicking on that um, that uh, parameter value there. Uh, when we work in the layout, we conditionally work in a layout driven mode if we want to size things properly. If I want to keep the resistor at a constant resistance value, but just scale its size, I can drag the handles and the resistor will um, respond. Additionally, if I want to change the resistance value, I can drag the corner and that'll update the resistance value instead of just keeping the aspect ratio different. Now, of course, when we start changing the width of the resistor, we need to be careful because that's also going to change the current handling capability. And that's something that you'll need to keep an eye on if any of your resistors are drawing significant current, especially for the nichrome metallization, because that tends to be a bit more sensitive, although the, um, the N minus can be as well, or actually the the high value resistance can be as well sensitive to current densities. So you just want to sort of keep an eye on that and consult the TriQuint um, design manual to make sure you're uh, up to date on what the current handling capability is or the current handling per unit width. Now um, that's the resistor. We're also going to take a look at, at the inductor. Let me close these windows. I'm sorry, not the inductor, the capacitor, um, because we will be using a few of those in our design. And I've also set up a very simple sort of um, schematic to look at some of those and we'll open up the layout at the same time and tile those uh, from one side to the other. Now I've got three different capacitors here. One is uh, the standard capacitor and again this comes in the intelligent model uh, version as well as uh, the one that doesn't uh, keep track of the lines that are coming into it. Um, and you can see here that for um, this first capacitor we're able to vary the um, capacitance value and the width. So I can plug in a value for the capacitance and it'll resynthesize itself for that width. Um, those of you familiar with the layout environment will notice that I don't have the auto snap feature on because the, um, the rat's nest appeared when I resized the resistor. I'm sorry, resized the capacitor. Um, but that's okay for the moment. We're not doing any detailed layout. Uh, I can additionally change the width and it'll resize the capacitor for that capacitance with that width. And we can also work in a layout driven mode. And if I start moving the, um, the drag handles that are in the middle, it'll try to keep the capacitance the same. And if I drag the corner, it'll increase the capacitance. Okay, so that's the, um, the standard capacitor, if you will. The second one here is uh, an area-based capacitor or an aspect ratio-based capacitor that also comes in both the intelligent and standard versions. And with this, I can also change uh, the capacitance value and it'll keep the aspect ratio the same, or I can change the aspect ratio and it'll keep the capacitance value the same. And similarly, I can drag inside the device and it will try to honor as best as possible what I'm doing to the capacitor and I can always just drag the corner to make it bigger. So let's undo some of those so we can get back to a decent value there. Okay now the the last one here is is uh, one of my favorites. It's a, a, a polygonal cap or a polygon capacitor and what we're able to do with that is um, just double click on the device in the layout and we can fill a space with capacitance, if you will, fill a space with an MIM capacitor as we start um, moving and drawing this around. So um, 
you can see there one of the hazards of working with the polygon cap is just dragging an edge because these are all active points on a polygon. But if I double click on one of them, I can start routing an arbitrary shape for my polygon. And lo and behold, it draws that uh, MIM capacitor for you based on that polygon, which is DRC correct, and it automatically synthesizes or tells you what the capacitance value is in the schematic. So in this way, we can, um, if we have extra space on our chip and we want some uh, bypass capacitance or the um, the simulations that we're doing are suggesting that a capacitor should be as big as we could possibly make it, or we just have some sort of odd area that we need to fit a very, very precise capacitor in, the um, the uh, TFCMP or the or the polygon based capacitor um, really fits the bill and allows us to accomplish that. So let's go back to our design that we were working on last time and see how implementing some of these elements impact our design. So we'll go back to our project and open up our layout and you can see I'm sorry in, in the schematic you can see in the schematic that in our input matching network I, I still have my microstrip so I can accurately represent the spacing between the components and the impact of those lines um, immediately but now I put in one of those aspect ratio capacitors and if you remember previously we had one picofarad here's still that um, rectangular spiral inductor that we used last time with the six turns and the M trace feeding it down to that uh, bond pad for our uh, bias if we choose to have an external bias supply. Uh, if we go through the rest of the design, you can see that I've put in a few capacitors, I'm sorry, I've put in a few um, uh, resistors uh, here and here uh, and here as well, one to feed the uh, bias to the second stage and two for the uh, drain of the uh, first and second stage respectively. And here on the output I put one of those uh, polygon caps because I, I want a nice big um, capacitor out there to um, to uh, give me a, a good uh, match across uh, the, the frequency band that we're interested in, uh, but also as a, a bit of protection uh, should anything uh, bad happen uh, frequency-wise. Um, so you also notice that I pulled um, another part from the TriQuint library, which is the uh, via, the through via here. And that's because we have to have good ground for these devices, uh, these EFETs, not to um, want to tend to oscillate. And uh, whereas in the previous video I had only one, now I have two, one on each end of the uh, device. And because I have an even number of gates, I'll be able to do that. Uh, so you can see on the first stage I have that and on the second stage as well. So let's go take a look at what the layout looks like for all this. There we go, we have our layout. Uh, and you can see that I've spaced things out a little bit. Here's the polygon cap. I just sort of, sort of drew it a bit arbitrarily. Um, you can see that we have some rat's nests or some fly lines here that aren't filled in. Um, there's, we haven't specified any sort of um, intrinsic metalization in the schematic, uh, so we could go back and change our schematic and put in some M lens or M traces, uh, or we can route these with the INETS feature, which is what we'll do in the next video. Um, but for now, let's just focus on the impact of implementing some of the resistors and capacitors here and see how that's changed our performance. Uh, you can also see that I've um, spaced out my um, spiral inductor here from my capacitor and from my FET, and I have those vias that I mentioned earlier positioned on either side of the FET. You'll also notice that there's little um, circles with X's on um, my first stage here. That's because I've anchored this down and I've frozen it, and I want to use this as a basis for building the rest of my design around this because of the all critical positioning of these vias relative to the FET as well as relative to my inductor. So I've sort of nailed those down using the uh, anchor feature. And let me just show you how we um, we get to that through the shape properties here. You can see I can freeze and I can use that as an anchor as well, which will help with my routing. Um, and I can do that for all of these devices. Okay, so those are sort of acting as a as a central location, if you will, that we're not going to move around and we're going to build the layout out and about from that. Um, but let's go and look at the performance now that we've added those uh, components getting rid of the idealized components and now working more in a um, getting down closer and closer to what we're actually going to ask TriQuint to build for us here. And when I simulate this, you can see I'm, I have by comparison here our initial design for noise figure and the stability from our refined design from last time where we were looking at the matching. And you can see that by implementing the parts, I've actually picked up a bit of stability 
uh, if you will. Um, and that's because associated with putting in those parts is um, some of the quote unquote parasitic, some of the non-ideal things, some of the extra losses um, that are going to help make this design a bit more stable than if we just put in a real capacitance. Um, or, in it, or a resistor that doesn't have any distributed effect. Implementing those elements in the triquint PDK and putting them into my um, design allows me to capture some of those non-idealities that in this case actually help my design. Now one of the things that uh, didn't get helped here, if you look at my gain, we're getting a bit peaky on the gain again and it's shifting down. Now this hasn't impacted us too much because uh, all things uh, coming together, all things considered, our noise figure is actually lower now than in our initial design. And I think that's because we have a bit too much inductance in that shunt inductor in our input match. If we go back to our layout, uh, you'll see that we need to add even more inductance to get our um, spiral inductor over here to the bond pad where we uh, want to be able to adjust the, um, the bias on each stage of the LNA if necessary. And um, if we actually go and route that out um, by just drawing that over, because this is an M trace again, so it's a routable line. And now I'm going to use another interesting feature in the AWR design environment. That's the snap to fit function. And uh, I'm going to line this up a little bit better and it'll give you a better feel for what the snap to fit function does. Um, I have this line and I want to make sure it makes proper connection to our bond pad. So I can just click the snap to fit tool and it just brings it right in and makes the proper connection. Um, all done, I don't have to do anything else. But let's see what the impact is on our performance. And you can see just adding that extra bit of line um, in the shunt position there um, just gives us more inductance, which is uh, constantly pushing down that um, frequency where the input match is idealized. And that also has the effect of sort of jeopardizing our um, stability as we push that down. You can see this is getting closer and closer to one. And so that's that's sort of a concern. Um, from a secondary basis, if you look at the overall layout here, this um, line meandering all the way back to come to this bond pad really isn't helping us all that much. And the extra inductance that we're getting from this line length coming off the T-junction to get to our spiral, as well as getting over here to the pad is, is really troublesome. So let's go to our layout. And um, actually, uh, before I do that, I want to um, look at some sensitivities here. Let's bring up the tuning tool. And now what I've done is I've set up a tuning on the uh, number of segments in our spiral inductor. And I've also set up the ability to tune on the width of our two input line lengths, just to get a feel for what the, um, the, uh, um, the effect of varying these uh, line lengths might be here and here. Now, what I've done to do that is I've added a parameter L that allows me to tune on those. And I have an L here and then, oh, I put it in the wrong spot. Let's put that L right over here. Good thing that we caught that. And now we're tuning on the right things. So we simulate there, have our tuner going. Now we can look at some sensitivities of what's going on. If I start dropping the number of segments you can see that that has the intended effect, as you would as you would guess, of reducing that input inductance and pushing the frequency back up. Um, it also tends to give us a lower noise figure, which is acceptable as well. Um, we just want to make sure that this inductance uh, that we're playing around with isn't the inductance from the pad to the um, T junction as well. So if we start playing around with that and makes that bigger, you can see that we have quite a bit of insensitivity to our the input line lengths there, and that's really not going to change things all that much. So really the inductance that we want to change to get a, a better um, gain or have our performance really centralized around the 5.8 gigahertz metric um, is to change that inductance back down to um, a smaller value. So it turns out that um, 5 is actually a really good value um, because as you'll see in the layout, when we have an inductance of 5, and I snap this all together properly, I have to go fix those lines after playing around with them and tuning. But if I snap together our uh, line feeding out of the T with our inductor, you can see that now the inductor terminates in a position that's really great for us to, um, to go ahead and route this line from. So you'll see why I did that in a second when I take my M trace and snap that together. You can see that sort of shape is the right shape. And I'll pull that up a little bit, and then we'll do the snap to fit. 
and we have our feed from our now smaller spiral inductor, but I would say more advantageously routed spiral inductor to put us in that proper position there. And if we go and look at our performance now, it's uh, right where we want it to be, where um, we have some good stability, although again, we're pushing the, the limits here. We may want to look at that more closely. And we're basically back to the same performance that we had going into this exercise of adding the resistors and capacitors. So um, in this segment here, we've, we've uh, continued to develop the layout by looking at the resistor and capacitor elements and cells that are in the triquint uh, process. We've also re-optimized our choice of inductor to um, get uh, back into the parameter space and back into the design performance space that we were expecting based on our earlier designs. And we actually have a layout that's starting to look a little bit like uh, what we would expect to send to Triquint for manufacturing. We have advantageously uh, relayed out that inductor so we can access that bond pad if we want some control over the bias. And um, we now understand that there really is no impact on changing the input line lengths uh, feeding from the input pad to that T-junction and then into that first stage. Well, that's it for this uh, segment of designing the uh, Mimic LNA. If you'd like more information about any of the features I've showed you, there are additional AWR TV videos. Uh, there's uh, white papers. Uh, you can download a copy of Microwave Office and try this out for yourself with the AWR Mimic process. And if you still have more questions, I'd like to encourage you to contact your AWR sales professional.